Welcome, everyone. Uh, let's, we're going to talk about uh, air traffic control, insecurity, and ADSB. Um, my name is Ryder Kunkel. I've got all the gobbledygook after my name, security researcher. I'm actually here on my own, not with um, uh, any company or anything. I just thought, uh, and I, I see my beer coming, and uh, uh, just on my own, and I just thought uh, it would be interesting to talk about this. So some of the agenda we're going to talk about is uh, who I am, get the product placement in, uh, and uh, uh, ATC background, a little bit about ATC background, air traffic control background. Sure. You want to wait a minute? You, all, right. all right. He wants me to wait. We can always, we can do a do-over on the audio, AV. Maybe not. He wants me to wait. Sure. Anybody have a hardware hacking badge question I'll answer? Oh, sure. What? Hardware hacking badge question. You connect all the wires together until it burns your chest. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the neat thing, you know, Joe Grant talked about it. The, the only thing that I'll talk about that uh, there's one pin on here that is really useful. It's a reset pin. You could take one pin to ground and it reboots, uh, you know, it resets the processor. I'm thinking reboot. Resets the processor. Then you don't have to take the battery in and out. Um, people have been having problems with the battery, the physical plastic thing breaking off the back of their badge because they keep pulling the battery in and out. You know, one solder point and then you take it to ground. And where's ground? There's ground all over the badge. So, um, I, and afterwards I can show you which, it's that one. Everybody see the pin? <laughs> Um, so, and then can any, yes, that one, exactly. And here I'm talking to you all. Oh, well. Yes. Oh, there's only one layer. Come on. There's only one layer. That's, I think Joe Grant said that in his talk. Only one layer. Hmm? Oh, you missed it. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yes. A drill press. No, I don't think so. That's cool. Has everybody seen the big badge together? Yes. Can you what? Uh, all the component. There was a hardware kit that was being sold and is sold out. So, um, but the parts list is on here. To, to find the parts. Uh, I, the only thing they said was that's really hard to solder is the microphone. And I'm not a hardware guy, but actually had a solder the microphone on here. It's the solder pads are underneath. You have to do something special. I, 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 it was above me. I just learned how to surface mount solder. So are we doing? We good? Okay. We're going to start over. Do over. Get the, get the product placement in there again. Okay. Uh, air traffic control. Uh, insecurity and ADSB. Uh, my name is Ryder Kunkel with a bunch of letters afterwards. I'm a security researcher. I'm just here on my own, not with uh, my company or anything. Uh, didn't want to get shut down like other people. <laughs> uh, who, I'll talk a little bit about who I am, uh, ATC background, and we'll uh, talk about uh, a disk operating system on the oh, denial of service attack on a air traffic control tower. Uh, we'll talk about the state of the airline security and where we are going. Uh, and then, you know, this thing, ADSB. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the security field for more than 12 years. Worked with secure operating systems, those Rainbow Series books. How many people have seen the Rainbow Series books from the 80s? Anybody have a real set, like a real orange book? Oh, one hand. You know, what a shame. They really wanted to make that available to everybody and, you know... So they're still out there if you want to read through them. Firewalls, proxies, trainers, a ham radio operator, and a private pilot. So I have to put this first slide in. After this talk, flying is safe. Uh, commercial airlines is the safest mode of transport. Uh, you've all probably heard it. You're more likely to die driving to the airport and from the airport than in a commercial airplane. Our plane's going to fall out of the sky after this talk. Uh, no, not for anything that's in the talk. Um, I can't talk about icing or weather or anything like that. Is flying safe after this talk? Definitely. Is some of this talk illegal? Well, 
You tell me. And uh, the disclaimers don't do this. Um, there's some seats up in the front. If you guys want seats in the front. Um, so, and uh, if I hadn't mentioned, we're we're um, let's first ask if anybody's a pilot. Anybody a pilot? Actually, more. Yay! Let's hear it for pilots. We're what? Less than a million, five hundred thousand, right? It's horrible. I feel like a dying breed. I don't know. It's uh, it's great. You all should learn to fly. Okay, so what we're not going to focus on is airport physical security, cockpit door security, um, you know, x-ray security, you know, all of those things. Uh, we're going to focus on the computers used by air traffic control, how airplanes report their position to air traffic control, and this thing called next-gen ATC. And you know it's next-gen because they capitalized a G in the middle of the word, so that's got to be cool, right? Um, so uh, also I want to just mention of why I came up of, of this talk. Um, you know, it, uh, uh, I, I, I've, you know, and rightfully so, you all have come up with great talks about how to hack wireless networks, you know, SSL vulnerabilities. But, you know, I want to do something different. And we're, we're a smart bunch here. And when I show you some of these slides, you're going to be like, why? Why haven't more be people been talking about this information? Um, okay, so... Um, you know, air traffic control is busy moving planes through the air. You know, FAA, that's their job, planes from point A to point B. Um, and, uh, you know, ATC, uh, not uh, focused a little bit on the network security equipment, you know. Uh, in some ways, people would say, who would want to hack a radar scope? And in the beginning, ATC radar scope was as a physical radar out there on the field with a big hard wire to one tube that, you know, swept around in a circle. Um, you know, standalone system. And through the years, they figured out, oh, well, they can make, you know, analog repeaters, and then they can make two scopes, and then somebody said, oh, we can just put that over TCP IP, and, you know, and not really thinking. Um, I, uh, um, so we'll, we'll get into them. So I want to give you a little bit of background on air traffic control, uh, air traffic control, these VORs, transponders, and flight plans. Okay. So what is ATC? Can everybody see this? I keep, you know, whenever you get um, pictures, you try to blow them up and blow them up. So I want to just give a thing. If people don't know this, this is from a pilot's point of view. So when the little airplane takes off on the, right, on the left there, um, he has an airport tower. He takes off, and there's track on that he has departure control, in route control, and oceanic control. Um, you know, not a plug for United Airlines, but I still love on Channel 9 and United Airlines, you can even today hear the cockpit transmissions. Um, how many people, anybody listen to that on United? Hey, yay! So that's great hearing that stuff and, you know, hearing when, uh, you know, you know uh, when you get put in a hold or something like that and the plane keeps turning, you know why, you know. Um, you're like, somebody's like, why well, the plane keeps turning right? Why is that? <laughs> Um, so, and you also can kind of see that with the control tower, um, there's a whole uh, back end system that the air traffic control has, um, the ATC, SSC, ATC system command center um, that uh, gets planes from point A to point B. Um, or, originally, this system was all uh, proprietary and, um, you know, hardwired, not, not connected to anything. And slowly, through, you know, modernization, this has been TCP IP networks and, you know, Windows 2000 and <laughs> so and also there's these things. How many people have ever seen one of these on taxiing around an airport? You know this big bowling pin thing. So this is called a VOR VHF omnidirectional radio range. It's pretty darn cool that uh, this. I uh, won't go into that much of the electronics, but basically this is what planes today um, will navigate from point A to point B, and they're spread out through the whole United States, and planes will take off. Um, um, from, you know, the ground and they'll navigate from point A to point B. So um, there is more direct routing, but it's really, um, these are the uh, help make the airways in the sky that planes will navigate from point A to point B point a, using these uh, VOR devices. Uh, this will come up uh, in a minute. Not that I found any, you know, problems with uh, anything transmitting on VHF, no encryption and so this is also what an airplane transponder looks like today, and that's a, for those that fly now, you know, that's a pretty old one with, that probably has vacuum tubes in it. Um, yes, vacuum tubes. Um, and uh, um, it has uh, a way that uh, there's a unique number that uh, air traffic control can tell you, a unique number that you program into the 
into the device. And what this is for, the uh, transponder is for, is when uh, radar systems deployed out through the um, entire United States, um, when a radar system will sweep a plane and, quote, paint a plane, um, it will negotiate or interrogate the radar, uh, interrogate the transponder, and the transponder will respond with um, its unique number, the four-digit number, and also an unconfirmed altitude from the plane, which I thought that was interesting, that air traffic control is relying on the, the unconfirmed altitude that the plane is saying. That's how it is today. Um, so um, that, that'll come in, into play in a little bit. Um, and then there's also these things called flight plans. So think about if you want to drive from here from Vegas to Los Angeles, you know, you probably would, whenever, look at some mapping program and, and uh, you know, say, oh, I want to take this interstate, that interstate, that, that interstate. You sort of have a plan for how you want to drive from point A to point B. Well, when, when pilots, either private pilot or commercial pilots, um, they'll actually have a plan for, I want to take off from Vegas and fly to LA, so I might fly, take off from Vegas and fly from VOR, this VOR, to that VOR, to that VOR, and get to Vegas. So that's what their request is. Well, a flight plan is just a request to the FAA. That goes in, into a, a central computer, and the FAA um, will then figure out, oh, well, five other planes are trying to say, take the same road, and there's going to be too much traffic. So maybe they'll send a couple planes a different way. Um, and so every the, these flight plans um, is just a request, and we'll see in a minute how FAA will actually say, you know what, no, we don't want you to take that interstate. We just want you to take the bumpy, dirt, two-lane roads from here, from, uh, you know, L.A. to, you know, from Vegas to L.A. Okay, I, uh, I commented out D.B. Cooper to save a little bit of time. <laughs> but uh, I'll just quickly mention D.B. Cooper. You can't have an uh, airline talk without D.B. Cooper, and maybe I'll, I'll just bring up the slide anyway. Uh, D.B. Cooper. How many people have heard of D.B. Cooper before? Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, talk about it. I, I, I love the fact that they have what a proposed sketch um, of him. And I really wonder if he was really wearing a jacket and tie. I guess it was a, a different time then, right? <laughs> In fact, here's a skyjacker and he's wearing, you know, a, a tie. So, yeah, legendary. If you, for those that don't know, a legendary skyjacker. He, um, he stole 200 thousand dollars when, man, it doesn't seem like much. Um, and he actually uh, requested from them. He got parachutes and he um, pulled open the air stair in the back of a 727 and parachuted out the back. Um, was never found again. Um, it was, in my mind, it was unique because um, they didn't think that anybody would do that. He was on the flight. They thought he was going to go to Mexico um, and maybe the parachutes were uh, a cover, so it was it was very interesting. There's a lot of theories of what ever actually happened to him, but um, it was you know somebody that analyzed the system and used uh, you know, used it to you know his advantage. Um, and then I want to talk about 9/11 only from this one piece. It was an absolutely horrible event. We all know that, but the hijackers knew enough to turn the transponders off in the commercial airlines airliners. There's, they knew enough from their flight simulator training that there's a magic button. And yes, in those big planes, this is not what the transponder looked like. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, but they knew enough. You see it has an off. All of transponders have an off button for reasons um, that, uh, sometimes, that you need that. Um, and then once when the hijackers turned the transponder off, then what happened? The planes were not transmitting their altitude. So the 9-11, the hijackers... Uh, you know, air traffic control did not know the altitude that the planes were at. Um, I don't know how, how many people knew. Did any people know that 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 they had turned that? Wow, not many people. Well, some people. It's kind of surprising that uh, you know that they knew enough to do that. And you know, we all know they had certain manufacturers' GPSs on the dashboards so they could find things. Um, so, and th this is true that we've not developed anything to mitigate this attack countrywide. That if if somebody were to turn, if somebody were to take over, you know, cockpit, and you got to get through all the door and everything. But if the transponder is off, we would not know their the plane's altitude. The only place is this ADIS, and I love this name, and I always write it down so I don't mess it up. Air Defense Identification Zone. 
Um, and that is around Washington, D.C. It's an extremely uh, secure, well, it, it's, a, it's a flight area th uh, 30 miles around Washington, D.C. that um, they have all sorts of things to uh, mitigate planes trying to fly into the Capitol. Um, and as a side note, anybody, and as a side note, that if if you were to have your transponder like this with one two zero zero in the ADSE, you would get visits from jets because um, they have specifically said this is a squawk code that you do not. You use this everywhere else throughout the country, but this is a code you do not squawk inside Washington D.C. So they could sort of tell if there's a newbie flying around in D.C. Um, not knowing what they're doing. Okay, so this one was a great story. Uh, how many people heard of that one pilot to try to fake his own death? Yeah, this is, you know, you don't head towards Eglin Air Force Base. <laughs> Bad idea. Anybody know where Eglin Air Force Base? Right in the panhandle of Florida? Yeah. Yeah, he didn't look at a map or something. So for the story, what it is is here's a pilot. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, I'll say allegedly, but I think some facts have come out where he tried to fake his own death. So he was in a he was in a high performance airplane that was pressurized at altitude. Um, in um, probably people can scream out the state he took off from. I think it may have even been Indiana, and he was heading south towards the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and he declared an emergency, saying that his front windshield had caved in on him and he was covered in blood, and oh my gosh, he's going to die and everything. Um, and he descended his airplane. But, you know, from reading some of the reports, the air traffic control, they just, this, the guy must not have been good with social engineering or something. They just f smelled something fishy with the way he was talking, the way the plane leveled out at 5,000, 7,000 feet or something. So the gentleman set the plane on autopilot, and at five or 7,000 feet, he, bar he bailed out over the bayou. Now, because he was flying south, and Eglin Air Force Base, one of the biggest, biggest Air Force bases, you know, two F-16s actually intercepted the plane They got there, and they came up on the wing. They noticed that the cockpit door was open, there was no lights on in the plane, and they had done, obviously, they probably did flare and chaff and tried to do whatever they can uh, to look at the plane, and it appeared that there was nobody in the plane. Um, the plane actually ended up crashing. The pilot didn't even do enough, um, he didn't even have enough fuel on board. It crashed in a residential area in the panhandle. It didn't even make it to the Gulf of Mexico. So, but I just found it fascinating how you know, he was another, maybe he was, you know, trying to be D.B. Cooper or something like that and, and fake his own death. Um, uh, it just was very interesting. Um, but one of the points was I thought it was interesting how that the air traffic control towers just kind of felt something fishy in the way the plane had moved and what it did um, that they um, had scrambled the jets and the jets had actually be able to come up on the plane that quickly. So... So switching gears, I want to talk about you know, my proposed denial of service attack on an ATC tower. So I, I felt some very warm fuzzy. I was talking to a goon before, and he said, oh, you know, he might, or this and that with the FAA. And I started talking about this, and he said, oh, you know, I, he was like, oh, that's BS. And then he sort of thought about it a little, about five minutes ago, wow, that would work. <laughs> So, you know, I always, I always feel, you know, I was worried about things like this, that um, if, um, if, you know, people, you always see the BS flag and you always wonder if these things are real. So, what, before I show it to you, uh, what I want to say is that I just want to propose to stop planes from taking off. So if we could, planes would be able to land, planes would be able to get from point A to point B, but if we could find a way to stop planes from, commercial planes from taking off, um, with, you know, um, or slow them down, that would be bad, right? You know? Um, and, you know, maybe you could take it to the next step. I really, uh, um, I really like what Joe Grant said in his parking meter thing that he sort of talked about as a high level um, of what you can do with parking meters and that maybe somebody will going to take that to the next level um, with that. So it's just, a, just an idea. So, uh, the proposed attack is get a fake ID. Well, uh, there might be people here that you can get fake IDs, and of course, it's illegal, right? Um, get an aviation medical. Anybody know why? 
Anybody, can anybody tell me a quick quiz? So there, what, what, what do you get when you get an aviation medical certificate? I didn't hear what you said. You get a, that's right, you get a student pilot certificate, and with your student pilot certificate, you get issued a unique certificate number. So this unique certificate number is, so I, fi I find it interesting in the process as it is that you have to go to a doctor's office and the doctor that certifies you that you're okay, there's different classes of medical certificates from class three, class two, and class one, uh, commercial airline pilots that are flying with their, you know, for United and all those, they have to get a class one medical and have to renew it and um, but I find it's interesting if you, you know you get a student pilot certificate with this unique uh, certificate number that goes in a database, which we'll kind of talk about. So once when you have this fake person and the certificate number, now you can use that name and authenticate yourself with these websites called Duat and Duats. And there's a couple other ones that even there's a FlightAware that I had completely forgotten that you could easily use FlightAware and AOPA website. Um, that Duat and Duats, um, everybody's registered for websites before, but when this website you register, your username, you know, user, and it, ha it requests your pilot, student pilot certificate number before it will let you log into this website. Or the, the two different websites, so we get two chances. Uh, once when you log in, then you're an authenticated user. It, is, it has SSL running, so uh, you're an authenticated user in the website. Right? So you could create and submit multiple flight plans. Um, and when you create a flight plan, right, remember what a flight plan is, it's my request to get from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. That request has got to go to a central computer. Central computer has to say, oh, a lot of people are doing that. Well, maybe I want to, uh, you know, send a different routing. So if you could take this, um, and then after the, and then what happens is there's a physical printer inside air traffic control towers where it prints prints out a paper tape, and that paper tape is what the FAA will say is your um, request. So with that, if you could find a way to um, have that little printer sprint, print out a lot of, you know, false requests. Um, you might be able to slow down, you know, some of the other people trying to use the system. Um, it was just an, just an idea. Um, with that, what's uh, also uh, uh, interested, uh, what's also interesting um, is that, well, we'll, we'll talk about that. So we'll talk about those websites. So um, this is what sort of a medical certificate looks like where you get a unique number. And the websites do at and do at. So this is what the do at website looks like, um, where after you've authenticated, you get an access code, password, and um, aircraft ID. So the aircraft ID would be the aircraft that you would like to make a, a flight plan with. Um, and I had to throw this slide in here. Did not anybody notice the A was capitalized? I don't know. It just really bugged me that here they're trying to warn me off and the A was capitalized. I don't know. I, Whatever. But so, yes, warning, 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 government aviation, you know, this is bad, this is illegal. Um, and this is what the um, flight plan form looks like that one, and I left it blank. You guys uh, left it blank, and you would have to figure out how to um, uh, fill it out and submit it. Now, there are some other ways that, that you could um, do this having multiple flight plans. There are ways you can call on a telephone number. Um, and uh, talk to uh, whether you talk to a briefer and have a flight plan submitted, but you would have to. Uh, and what's interesting about that is there's no authentication. They don't ask your pilot certificate number. It's just you talking to somebody on the phone. And by the end of the conversation, they will type in and have a flight plan get submitted into the system. Um, so. Um, what's also interesting is um, potentially, I left the top of the header, but potentially, uh, you know, after you're an authenticated user in through, you know, inside the SSL, maybe there's a way you can write a script to have this do this, or maybe there's a, you know, I don't know all cross-site scripting and things like that and all the stuff with headers, but, you know, you're an authenticated user. You know, they already think you're going to be doing good things. So this isn't like trying to break the SSL's encryption. You're already in there. 
Um, this is what the, so if you completely fail being able to do that with this website, well, guess what? You have a whole different company and a whole different website you could try it with. The same medical certificate called Duats. And this was also, uh, uh, the next slide was a little interesting too. They still have Telnet access. Um, I'll just say that. They have Telnet access. <laughs> Whatever that means. I don't know what that means. I'll take a drink of beer. But look, uh, uh, you know, I have complete respect with controllers, the FAA. The FAA is trying to move planes from point A to point B. These three tools, DUAT and DUATS, help pilots be able to submit pl flight plans quicker, be able to get planes quicker from point A to point B. Okay, that's why they're there. You don't have to then physically call somebody in a plane. It's neat here to see the My Duet shortcut. So if you keep flying from Las Vegas to LA, you can, have, you can bring up your uh, uh, flight plan and have this rapidly fill out. And, and instead of talking to um, you know weather briefer, you could actually save time. And uh, uh, it also uh, saves money. But you know there's real reasons why we have these websites for efficiency. Um, it's just... Uh, you know, I don't, you know, I, I wonder if they've looked at, uh, you know, how secure they are, um, which we'll answer. Um, also another, uh, another thing is um, every air traffic control tower actually has telephone numbers. Um, and this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing, um, like we've all seen in the movies, if you actually have to call a tower, um, um, there, these numbers are there. But like anything, if you're focusing on one specific tower, you could always do a denial of service attack also on the telephone system and, and slow down inbound calls. No, of course, controllers would have cell phones and other things like that and other sidelines and red phones and things. But, um, um, and then, of course, um, what happens in other countries sometimes where the radio frequencies, they're all in the clear, um, you know, VHF. Here, here's, a, here's a quick question. With the FAA, is it... FM or AM? Anybody know what the ATC is? AM. I heard some Fs come out of there. It's AM. It's AM. Yes. It's all. Anybody know why? Long range. Yes. Yes. So it's VHF AM. Kind of cool. Little. Um, so uh, um, you, you could potentially uh, uh, jam the ATC radio frequencies, which is interesting. You know, sometimes in some foreign countries, the taxi drivers have hacked their little, you know, radios. They talk to each other, and they might uh, interrupt, you know, you know, uh, you know, screw up frequencies that air traffic control is trying to talk on. Um, but if one would want to do a focused attack in one specific tower, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of vectors to slow down planes from taking off. Now, planes will still be able to get from point A to point B. There's processes in place. If certain things happen that they will still be able to land. Planes are not going to follow the sky. It's just trying to slow down planes from taking off. Okay? So, and then I kind of sort of stepped back and kind of looked around. Maybe drank a beer. And the FAA published a report. How many people read this report? Anybody read it? Who's the pilot and didn't read this report? Like, this actually made press. I, I was like, oh, no, I'm going to talk about something that's already made some press. So this is a public document, Review of Web Application Security and Intrusion Detection in Air Traffic Control Systems, FAA Report Number. So really, nobody, has anybody seen it? Anybody shy? Okay, okay, a couple people have raised their hands. Okay. Um, um, so this is, this is in the FAA's own words to kind of back up Maybe, maybe not what I was saying about these two Duat and Duat's websites and that. Um, so uh, this is right out of the report um, that they looked at a total number of 70 web applications, 70 into 763, I don't know how many that is a person. But so the number of high-risk vulnerabilities, 763 high-risk vulnerabilities that they found in 70 web applications. Is that a lot? I don't know. Um, so it, it was shocking. Um, so and then also from their uh, report, um, they, the, the, you know, not, I don't want to get into too much detail, but the 
you know, there's the, the internet out there, this, um, the FTI aviation tele telecommunications infrastructure, uh, mission support um, network, um, mission supports networks there, and then they have the air traffic control, the, you know, the ATC operational systems. Now, um, this is, the, see that dotted line? This is in the report. That dotted line should not happen, right? Right, mission support, you'd hope, or you'd hope that there's firewalls or something um, there. So, um, and I guess that they have found cases where the two networks have been connected together, um, which is not good, which we'll talk a little bit about. So here's also some things that they, this is right out of the report where, with IDS. So um, um, what was interesting is, you know, total number of facilities, 734. Well, it's really not, because if you see the little star, it says in the thousands, remote sites. So in the thousands of remote sites, so on the ATC network, which would be this bottom in blue, how many IDSs allegedly do they have deployed? Um, and then they, on the mission support network, they only have 11 uh, currently. Um, so uh, it, it actually is a pretty damning report, um, which I 100% also defend. They are working. I've talked to some people already at this conference that they're already working on contracts and, and they're working on trying to fix these things, and, um, which is good. Um, so, but, I, you know, I, I was... Now, these are the two things that I found in this document that nobody else picked up in the press. Does anybody see anything wrong with these two things? These are in the PDF that was published on the internet. So the first top box, um, now the, uh, you know, I, I don't know, uh, you know, everybody knows secret top, you know, classified, secret top secret. I would almost kind of, oh, no, you know, there you go. That's what, that's what happens when you lean on a laptop. Um, you get, Shift F5. So the, I would almost sort of call some of this maybe sensitive information. So here in this report, so of all those vulnerabilities, they list out the networks that they looked at. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have had it as a footnote. I, I just, I don't know. What do you think? Would you have put that in your report, showing all these vulnerabilities and also listing the networks that they looked at? Um, uh, and... Um, so, and the Juno, you know, the Juno Aviation Weather System, which we'll talk about a little bit, which is in uh, um, Sarah Palin State, <laughs> Alaska. <laughs> uh, that's in Alaska. Um, but, and this bottom one, I thought it was interesting. So the FAA, uh, rightfully so, wrote a response to all of the things that were found in the uh, all the things that were found in the uh, talk. So this was in, this was at the footer of one of the responses of this S colon backsplash splash, you know, of the whole, you know, document. Um, I, I would have thought that it, right? I mean, you're not, I wouldn't have put that in the document. So, um, and uh, in the document, they sort of talked about that, um, you know, they're going to deploy IDS by February 2010, so that's, that's good, right? And in the document, what... So the FAA response, 4-1609 was the FAA response to this document, and by February 2010 was when they're going to... Okay. Um, so let's talk about also a little bit about the uh, next-gen air traffic control system uh, and this concept ADSB. So the next-gen air traffic control system is they're going to convert from some proprietary hardware to commercial off-the-shelf hardware to, um, which, uh, you know, maybe may be a good thing. Um, they're talking about phasing out radar and ILS instrument landing systems in certain areas because radar and ILS are very expensive to maintain. Um, um, and the ideas would be that they will go to a system that each plane in their transponder of a plane, they'll replace planes transponders, and a plane, tra a plane will report its who am I, latitude, longitude, and altitude in clear text. And based on each plane reporting who they are and where they are in, in physical space, that that will be displayed on the controller's screens and allow the controllers to move planes around. Um, so... Uh, is the transmission encrypted? 
it is in clear text. So, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Go ahead. Right, so uh, the gentleman was saying there's no reason to encrypt it if you can look up and see the plane. Was that what you were saying? If you could see the plane. Okay. I, but this would be, uh, you know, the idea that... Um, I heard some laughs over here. I'm, I just repeated what he said. Uh, so, but the idea would be that um, you would no longer have another method. So, for example, if 9-11, uh, if they were to find a way to turn off this new ADSB transponder and not have radar, well, maybe the plane might just completely disappear off, ev off everything. Yes? A little louder. Go scream at me. Could, could they put a different location? He said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> so uh, it, I, that's a, you could. So um, with this, I'll, I'll go to the, the next slide, just talk about it. So the idea that this who am I and where am I is all in one encrypted packet. Um, and this is already the, um, some of this next-gen ATC has already started to be deployed in Alaska. Uh, as And I tell you, I know it saved lives because it's been deployed um, to help um, pilots. Uh, they've been have a lot of aviation accidents in Alaska. So this has been some uh, ADSB as a test bed to, to help um, planes in the air. Um, but one of the interesting things, remember I said Juno? Well, I'm going to go back. You know, well, Juno was one of the sites that has had, you know, vulnerabilities. Well, that's in Alaska, and um, they've had some, um, you know, uh, not on the, um, not on the operational systems, but they've had some trouble in Alaska with uh, with computers getting hacked to, into in Alaska, which is supposed to be our test bed for the next gen ATC system. Um, so. With, uh, you know, with this insecurity of the who am I and where I am all in one encrypted packet, um, and that the idea that they're going to rely on GPS is the backbone of the ATC, of the next-gen system. And then did, how many people read that a report that, uh, you know, GPS satellites are failing faster than, than got some hands over here, failing faster than they're, they're intended. And even there's a brand new GPS satellite we put up. They were in commissioning it, and they found it was not as accurate as it was supposed to be. Um, so they spent a whole bunch of money, and this new satellite was not that, not as accurate. Chinese could shoot them down, too. China, the gentleman here said the Chinese could shoot them down, too. I, I'm just showing you the stuff. You know, it's not wireless. We're not talking about wireless hacking. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting. You, know, you say Chinese, Chinese can shoot them down. I haven't done that much research. Um, allegedly, China has deployed ADSB throughout their... Um, country, and I don't know if that's true or not true. Anybody know about, about China and ADSB? Nobody's. So that's something to look into, which I wouldn't under. I, um, and for me, uh, you know, just having being a pilot, just having GPS be the backbone, I totally GPS has its uh, has its place. But I would always like to have the idea that you could have radar and ILS. If you don't know an ILS, it's basically um, some. Uh, electronic signals sent up from an airport. Uh, uh, maybe you've sort of seen those um, Yegi antennas. Anybody know what Yegi antennas? Yegi antennas, the end of a runway. That's um, that's a localizer antenna um, that is part of the uh, instrument landing system. There's many things in the field that allow um, uh, that allow the plane to land. I, I don't want to go into if there's potential vulnerabilities of the ILS system, but um, there are. They've uh, ILS system has been out a lot, and they're, they've mitigated some of the things people talking about um, jamming this and that, and, and so they're. Um, but uh, just just relying on uh, GPS as the only means of of that, and also that the planes themselves will be reporting their position, um, you know, makes me um, you know ma makes me a, a little nervous. So and oh. Uh, you know, you could easily fix this, you know, ADSB transmission. And, you know, ADSB stands for autom Automated Dependent Surveillance 
broadcast. So, and then even as broadcast, it still can have broadcast collisions. They have done some some things with uh, with that. But this is this is uh, part of the pieces that um, allegedly that the that with next gen ATC that we're going to be able to push planes, you know, get planes from point A to point A to point B quicker. Um, and maybe, maybe not. My personal opinion is I'd love to build build more runways, but unfortunately, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, we're closing more airports than building new runways. Um, but um, you know, like some people said, you know, trying to have ten planes all take off in a five minute window, I don't. Um, it, it's it's a challenge. So, but with this, uh, you know, being able to have, um, if the real reason with ADSB is that if you have these planes reporting their lat long and altitude, you, poten you could potentially mitigate a lot of air to air collisions if everybody's correctly transmitting their correct location. And it, it has a lot of benefits and safeties. I just question how much from the security and the and and I'm sure a lot of your minds are running as some people have thrown out some things already of maybe what you could do with this this system and uh, you know I have no agenda I just sort of am a pilot and had this idea of looking at these things and it was something different um, you know I'm not trying to get a contract or anything with any of these guys I just thought you all would be interested in these things um, I, I'm actually shocked that more of you had not have heard of that one uh, PDF document uh, I've I've read some, you know, uh, how many people have done uh, penetration testing and written reports. Okay, that's good. So, you know, so, you know, sort of a call to action is, hey, you know, take a listen to, you know, air traffic control, um, view AD, you know, ADS bro ADSB broadcasts, and, you know, maybe you become a pilot. Um, and I'll, I'll take uh, some questions, still have a little bit of time. Questions, gentlemen there in the black shirt. Yeah, this, sorry. It says DEF CON. Wait, sorry. <laughs> is there any potential for doing redundancy using over horizon radar? There is, but uh, according to the FAA, you know, radar systems are extremely expensive, and they're trying to minimize the number of new radar systems and decommission them because they're extremely expensive uh, to have and maintain. Um, Right, yeah, I don't know about that of reducing the number of radar. Yes? No, uh, the, the question is if I did anything looking at this in the ham radio technology APRS. Uh, I know APRS technology, um, but uh, I haven't done any comparison. There you go. There's a talk for you next year. You know, you've got something to talk about next year. So uh, anyone? Uh, sure. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, automatic flight processing, automated flight control. Um, I don't know that much about that, but um, uh, you know, you know, potentially there could, you know, there could be things with that too. Um, go ahead. I'll the, they did not look at VORs. Remember, it was just seventy web applications. It was just web applications that they looked at. They did not look at physical. The report, they didn't look at, no, they did not, there's, no, no, zero done. And remember that, uh, like, ILS systems have monitoring, um, you know, air traffic control towers have alerts in the towers of ILS systems. Um, there's also VORs, there's, there's processes that if VORs go down, um, that, uh, you know, that's all, um, um, you know, I'm trying to go to that one slide to get you the name. This one here. No, see, it was just web applications, n not VORs. Uh, the, this gentleman then, and then you. Yes? Uh-huh. So the question is, the, the, with ADSB, the who am I, um, and your latitude, longitude, um, and altitude is sent. Is there any sorts of signature scheme? Um, yes, even today, every transponder has, um, even without the four digit number, there's actually every transponder has a unique number. Um, so, uh, yes, the, that there will still be unique numbers. Um, you, you could potentially have the hardware and change those unique numbers. 
Um, so, but it's still set in the clear. Uh, you may be able to, ha- you know, have that fake signal, send of a TCAS alert or something like that. But yeah, I'm not really sure. The question: Can I make up a number and do that? I, I have no idea. So, and then the gentleman over here. So the question is, if you do not, so in the current system, if you do not broadcast your altitude in clear text, well, it's an analog system, so the, the uh, transponder, the mode S transponder, um, uh, has an altitude encoding, has a uh, hard-coded altimeter in your plane that, that um, will do that. There's another mode, it might be mode A, where, where you can set your GPS not to transpond. Uh, what the uh, FAA... Uh, what the controllers can do, they'll actually ask you what, what altitude you're at. And there are certain restrictions. If you're actually not squawking your altitude, the FAA has the right to not allow you in certain airspace. Um, and obviously, if you're in Washington, D.C. area and not doing that, that's bad. <laughs> yes, yes. And even, uh, you know, and even if it's a hardware failure, you could have hardware failure mid-flight you know, in the, in the ADAC, ADAC. Yeah, so. Right, right. Yes, in the. Has the FAA done any research or public reporting on the fact that if you're broadcasting these planes' positions, latitude and longitude, that because it's also open right now, it's for the closed system, and that I don't have the money to go out on my radar and be able to look at all the planes in my area? Right. Well, uh, so the question has the FAA blah, 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 blah? I, I'm not with the FAA, I've got no idea. No idea. I haven't seen that. Uh, uh, I'm sure they have. I, ha- I haven't seen, um, you know, they've known about the report. I'm sure they're trying to mitigate some of it. Um, but you guys are coming up with stuff I didn't even, didn't even think about. Oh, right in the hat. Correct. So the gentleman was saying that uh, UPS Cargo Airlines has already have deployed ADSB, and it's actually helped them uh, be able to land, pl- land planes quicker and land and take have planes take off quicker. Um, and it actually has saved money and uh, uh, increased efficiency. That's correct. But is it encrypted or unencrypted? Uh, it is still the ADSB technology, which you can read the spec that's out there. So no, <laughs> it's it is not encrypted. It's unencrypted. It's the, the specs out there that you can that you create. Uh, yes. I, I have I looked at this or that. But I have no idea about this or that vulnerability. I like I said, just a high level, just you know, you know, just looking at stuff and you know, uh, this is all stuff that's already out there on the internet. This is nothing. I just nothing. I don't know. Some people not not all that new, but I guess if people hadn't read this report, maybe. Uh, maybe it's a little new that that, but there was some press about this report, and I do know that the FAA is working uh, actively on on some of these things. Yes. Oh well, the question is, do I think the ADSB is an efficient use of taxpayer funds? I, I, it's a, I'm not going to touch that one. Uh, you know, it's I, I'm just telling you information. You make your own informed decision. You make your own decision. You know. So yes. So does the transmissions get used by other aircraft? I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Yes, that's where the safety factor comes in, where it, it has the potential to literally stop air-to-air collisions. That's cool. That's great. Um, because if, ever, if two ADSB planes are flying, each plane would hear that, hear the latitude, latitude, altitude, and be able to plot vectors and say, hey, wait a minute, we're on an intercept course. So that's, that's a good thing. I don't like air-to-air collisions. Yes. Um, it would be it would be a supplement to TCAS. TCAS is a whole other system. Um, so, well, there's I think there was a couple more. How much more time do I have? Uh, about three, minutes. three minutes. Okay, in the white shirt in the back. Yes. So the gentleman saying that, you know, if you could tell an airplane, 
you know, and do a DOS and tell another airplane there's another airplane next to it. I, you know, I hadn't thought of that. Whatever, you know. Um, it, you know, there's, you know, maybe, maybe I've generated some, you guys to think about it, maybe some more talks to, to come out. You know, I, I am a pilot. I want the aviation, I would like, you know, aviation security. And I think, I also want to say our controllers in the FAA, I mean, for the funds that they have, they're doing a bang up job with uh, what they're doing. Um, I'm not uh, at, at all negative or against them. I'm, you know, um, you know, and, it, and it's a funding thing why they can't keep radar going. They don't have the money to keep the radar systems going. So, yes? Yeah. Uh, so the, the question is, how did the filing of the fake flight plan connect with the other stuff? The, so good question. The idea would be that, you know, I was alleging that, uh, you know, you'd be able to write scripts and do this a lot. So, well, you know, that would mean maybe a cross site scripting vulnerability or something that this, you know, that this website would allow, you know, 20, 20 flight plans a second to be inputted. Um, well, maybe you can because look at all these application, you know, um, you know, I skipped over it. Uh, look at all these vulnerabilities that they found in web applications. So, did I, one second, did, did, I, did I answer your question? Okay, I just wanted to make sure, yes. Could just be noise or? Right. So, so, uh, so let me just I'll repeat the question for the camera. So the, the, the comment was with this, with this scan that, that you might want to ignore low because there, there is a level of noise whenever you just do a default scan of what you get. I, I'm, totally, I'm totally with you on that. Um, it, for me, it just shocked me on the number, the number 70 and the number 763. So uh, I'll get his attention again. But did, I, mean, all of, I mean, does it shock you, the number 70 and the number 783? Not really? You, Oh, okay. I, I won't say that for the microphone. So then you've read the document. Okay. Oh, okay. So, and I think we're, we, one more, que oh, one more question. Uh, he was first. Yes, go ahead. Um, so, it all depends on the tower. Um, and uh, so the question is, um, when you submit it for DUAT and DUATs, does it automatically get printed out at the tower? Um, it, it all depends on the, the tower. Um, and realize clearance delivery at some um, airports, clearance delivery is some person in the tower also. It might be the same person running, ta running ground. Um, so, you know, that, that was just one, one, you know, interesting attack vector I thought about. Now, obviously, yes, there are telephones that, that the controllers could, um, if that, you know, there, uh, I'm sure that there are things, if that physical printer thing is down, that they can do other ways to get um, flight plans and get planes to take off. Um, um, and like I said, it's not going to stop planes from landing. It's not going to stop planes from getting point A to point B. Um, but it was just a, it was an interesting idea of, of, you know, using the web to be able to um, you know, flood the central computer that tries to plot, you know, where we want to have all these planes go to. And I'm sure that they have pl some things in place to mitigate if they see the same tail number submit 50 flight plans in a minute that hopefully it, it doesn't allow that submission. So one more or not? Uh, sure, one, more. one more. Yes. Has the FAA? Has the FAA? I, I have no idea. I'm, I'll, I'll try to hear your question, but I have no idea has the FAA. But go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I'm, uh, so has the FAA communicated with me? No, I would be happy to uh, talk to them. I'm on their side. I mean, I, I, th this is a published, this document's up, published out on the internet. The bad guys know this. You know, the bad guys read this. And I if you go to, if you, you know, it, you know, if you're a private pilot, you learn about duat and duats. I mean, I can't be the only one that have thought of this. So, um, 
Okay. Well, I really thank everyone for coming to my talk. Um, I'd be uh, I'd be outside if you like to if you like to chat with me or or raise the BS flag or whatever. I'd be happy to uh, happy to talk with uh, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>